There was there was a wealth actually of um, of great theatrical history and dance history in that area. I want to talk a little bit about. You said that uh, one of the things that's so important to you is the nature of bringing dance into the community and working with children and school summer school projects, but also just the idea of using dance as a part of our. Uh, life experience sort of. absolutely mm -hmm. yeah it's <clears throat> we're, we're really in the midst of a, of a war at this point the uh, situation with the NEA is really dire the NEA uh, the National Endowment for the Arts okay. uh, and the the lack of funding that's coming in towards the arts for a civilized country which I hope that we would consider ourselves uh, we have probably the lowest per capita funding from the government of the arts of any civilized country on the planet um, when one realizes that 20 million dollars uh, more was given to military marching bands than was given to the entire uh, budget for the National Endowment for the Arts. I think it's a, it's a pretty frightening concept. And, and now that that's being slashed even more and more, um, the times are dire. So I think it's terribly important to be able to answer some of those arguments that have been brought up uh, concerning the elitism of the dance or the elitism of ballet and also the cutting edge um, really far-flung modern work, um, which is always brought akin to pornography. Uh, the fact is that I think dance at this point in American history must be injected into the culture on a daily basis. Uh, one of the things that my organization works very hard at is making sure that dance is a part of the daily life, whether that's putting it into hospitals, into churches, into prisons, into I don't care where, but get it out of the elitist look and bring it into day-to-day, -day, bring it into children's lives, into everyone's lives. Um, we've Was this one of the historical things that Jacob's Pillow did as well, when Jacob's Pillow started? <coughs> or was their dance just a little different than ballet? Well, how did that come Well, that, that was uh, Ted Sean and Ruth St. Dennis, mostly Ted Sean in the early days, and uh, he had found a place that was in nature, and he created um, the pillow, the pillow men, the pillow dancers, and um, where is it? It's in. Um, it's right outside of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, in Beckett, mm -hmm. Beckett, Massachusetts. And um, but there were classical dancers, Patricia McBride, that was involved in. Sure, things. there there mm -hmm. were many of the New York City ballet dancers um, participated there, and. Um, ha all aspects of the dance have, pr have really participated with uh, the ballet at some point, the, the ballet and into Jacob's Pillow at some point. Um, it really is the, the American mecca for dance and uh, a great place to model uh, my project after, which um, we have been doing. But did they bring it into the community as well? Did they go with this idea? Not so much. I mean, really, it, it really was more of a dance for dance sake. Um, what Tedshawn was particularly uh, effective doing was bringing in ethnic dance uh, into the mainstream of dance so that it could be perceived um, as part of the dance mm, vocabulary and culture, which is where so much of then, you know, Graham's work came from and Jose de Mon and Alvin Ailey, the idea of, of the ethnic part of America coming out into dance. Could we go back into history a little bit and talk about some of the, the Russian greats that, that uh, I think probably opened up initially mm -hmm. the world of dance in this country, like Diaghilev and Balanchine and mm -hmm. uh, Fokin and Pavlova? Well, all of them, um, you know, in, in Russia, they were, they were wonderful at that time period because they brought all the different aspects of the arts. The great artists, the great musicians, the great dancers, Diaghilev took them and, and melded them together as um, almost in a, in a wonderful... I, I would call it almost a circus of, of wonderful events. And then, of course, Balanchine, with his great love for the American uh, musical, took the very classical ballet and, and put the two together so that now it became an American form of dance. Though it was still ballet in its vocabulary, it now had that kind of showbiz feel to it, with, which sold and was uniquely American. So the Russian influence was certainly undeniable. Um, did he ever use, I know that Diaghilev used uh, some very famous artists in other areas, like Picasso and Matisse. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Balanchine do the same here? He, he did. Um, I, I know on a number of occasions he worked with, uh, with a number of wonderful, well, certainly, the, I mean, Stravinsky was, was one of the great marriages, uh, just in terms of music. There were a number of, of other well-known artists as well, but that seems to be on the decline these days and it's and i think that's a, a problem and something that should be explored further really being able to bring in other artists um, I, I think it probably has to do with the idea of budgets um, money stifling so much art these days but this is what you're trying to do basically you're trying yeah. to 
to provide a place of inspiration where you can get artists of all different kinds. You have musicians trying out new uh, pieces of music where you are as well, no? Yeah, I, I do. And um, I'm actually working now with... Um, with a, a musician who was a resident at Yado, which is an artist retreat in Sar Saratoga Springs, New York, and um, commissioning a score from the work he's done there. And then Yado has a, a choreographic fellowship there, so I'm trying to actually package things outside of artist retreats and then stick them back in. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're also doing that um, at Terpsichore as well, but we're really in our, still in our infancy. We're only two, two and a half years old. We've got a long way to go, but more of the established um, retreats and colonies, McDowell and Yaddo and um, places of that nature are picking up on the dance aspect, and I'm happy, happy about that. You talked about um, Saratoga, and uh, you know, I've always had a little bit this idea that there's a connection between horses and dancers. I mean, this is not a derogatory thing. I think it has to do with, you know, the, the physicality and the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find any correlation? Well, I think that there's an, an aspect. I mean, I've spent a great great deal of time in Saratoga, and you know, when one watches the races, um, there is an element of watching the horses and seeing sort of. Uh, the thing that man can imbue into the animal itself, sort of a man's They're high perfect. They're almost perfect. Yeah, yeah. And ballet dancers, of course, are... Strive for that perfection yeah. as well. So there is something about, you know, really the beauty. I mean, it's all, uh, very spiritual in a sense. I mean, I don't know how many people go to the races and see the spiritual aspect of it, but, <laughs> you know, come on, number two, come on, number two. You know, but, uh, but yeah, there is, when yeah. you watch them in the paddock mm -hmm. and you just watch them mm -hmm. parading, there's something really quite extraordinary and transcendent about that. Yeah. Well, you have to have fun. I, I, I try, I yeah. Far. I try to have fun. <laughs> no, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think we're going to take a little break, and we'll break. be back. We're going to have a look at Tommy's uh, film of his dances that have, he has been doing at his place in New Jersey, Terpsichore Sand. making a dramatic change in your home. Beauty, elegance, and simple efficiency to any of your rooms. There's a simple solution, and you'll find it at Champion Tile. Conveniently located across from the post office in downtown Bedford Hills, Champion Tile has a huge selection of Saloni ceramic tile from Spain, century shower and tub enclosures, and the finest imported tiles from Italy for your individual taste, and all under one roof. Ceramic tile not only adds beauty to any room, but nothing compares with their strength and durability. And you know, of course, they're so easy to clean and maintain. Champion Tile has one of the largest supplies of Italian and Spanish ceramic tiles in the entire area, and hundreds of decorative borders as well. And what's more, at prices that can't be beat. And for your convenience, Champion Tile is nearby in downtown Bedford Hills, right across from the post office. For your tile, simply dial 666-2828. It's Champion Tile. dancers around you, other artists, that makes a difference because you can tell when you come into a community of artists, it's a different environment than when you walk into a place and say, oh, what are those on your feet? It's not like going to a Broadway play and seeing everything painted in a box. It's like seeing it how it must have happened in the very beginning of time, when there were no theaters, when only music was just someone going, This is 
with Mary Michelle for WVIP, and we're back with Tommy Flagg and Terpsichore Sand. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the film segment on his place in New Jersey, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the dance world, and particularly Tommy's involvement, how he first got involved in, in dance. Uh, did you go to a college where there was a particular... <laughs> we, love this, we love this story because I'd, I'd gone to all male schools my whole life, and then I wanted to go to... Um, to Princeton University, and and I um, when I was in school, I, I was a pretty good wrestler, so I, I actually got gotten offered some scholarships, and so I thought that Princeton would also think that was a great idea and, and take me, but alas, they didn't, and so I was very upset. But I took a deep breath and I said, "Okay, fine, I'm not going to go to Princeton and an all, another all-male school. I think I'll go to." A girls' school now. <laughs> so I applied to every woman's college on the eastern seaboard that was taking men, and I, um, I ended up at, uh, at Skidmore College, which was, uh, the reason I did was it was a 16 to 1 ratio. So when I arrived there, there were all these very attractive young ladies, and it was great, and I, I thought, really, how can I really uh, enjoy myself to the fullest? So I proceeded to take ballet class. Seemed like a great idea. <laughs> So, I mean, where else can you find, you know, 24 very attractive young ladies in leotards? But what's and particularly funny is that you came from a background in wrestling. Yeah. And, and How does one go from wrestling to ballet? Did that work with easily? With a smile. With a smile. With a big smile. A very big smile. Oh, uh, it was great. great. And, uh, and Melissa Hayden, uh, who was one of the great, great uh, ballerinas at New York City Ballet, had taken over the... Um, <laughs> taken over the the, the dance program there, and she was she was hell on wheels, and uh, and and Millie is still an extraordinary uh, teacher. She's at um, North Carolina School for the Arts now, and um, doing a wonderful job. But to watch her work that room and watch her work those those dancers was uh, an extraordinary thing, and the beginning of um, really my. Uh, my but you you ha knew something about dance when you were younger, didn't you? Weren't sure. you a ballroom dancing? Uh? Yeah, yeah. I I'd done a lot of ballroom dancing, and I'd also done um, a tap and some other. I I I just never had an aversion to dance. I'd, my, I'd grown up with it, and it was something that was um, was part of my life. And I guess that's something that I I feel uh, strongly about is that we lose the dance is so far away now mm. from our general day-to-day. -day. I mean, if you'd walk up to someone at a party and say, um, would you like to dance? Their answer will be, no, I can't dance. Mm -hmm. Well, they can dance. Mm -hmm. But even in saying, no, I can't dance, uh, it's pushing it just that, that next step away. Right, like Gene Kelly. Gotta ah, dance. Gotta dance. <laughs> gotta dance. Yeah, no, it's really you know, there, I mean, and that's a wonderful statement in, in the fact that there are certain moods and energies in your being, and the only way that you can really express them is through movement and dance. Mm -hmm. um, the exuberance, I, I've always said exuberance and joy, abandon, are three wonderful areas of emotion that are really only properly expressed through movement and dance. Which the Greeks talked about with Dionysus. Yeah. The, the followers of well, Dionysus. Yeah, right? but you know, you <laughs> slam down four bottles yeah, of wine, exactly. and you know, you gotta dance. I mean, you really don't. You're not gonna just. You're not gonna play bridge. You mm. know, this is right. But it, there were other traditions where I think dance was part of the the meditation. Certainly in uh, the Sufi tradition Absolutely. and uh, yeah. the Native American with the drumming. We hear about this today with the shamanistic practice of drumming. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's it's interesting because you know when again when when you hear uh, someone hammering down the dance on these arguments of elitism. Well, I mean, meditation, religion, uh, culture. There, there's the, the the farming dance, the hoeing dance, and the, all the American Indian forms that celebrate the spirits or what happened in the day or animals or all those things. Absolutely, are part of our culture. Absolutely. And what were the dancers in the uh, Far East? Was it the Balinese, Balinese temple dancers, mm. which or and or if you go to Thailand or uh, India, India has five major forms of dance. Um, they're all uh, extraordinarily complex and uh, and beautiful, and you know that and and Africa, you know, I mean that's that's all been around, you know, way before ballet ever hit the the skids, and you know it's. Um, I happen to love ballet. It's my, it's what I happen to love. But you know, I mean, dance has always been part of life and culture. Absolutely. Well, and I think the kind of dance that you're trying to promote is a dance that goes back to these roots somehow. Well, certainly that it can yeah. be identified as something that mm -hmm. is all part of us. Right. I've always said that dance is a language similar to the the Chinese language, one language with 50 dialects within it. I mean, Americans tend to be terribly myopic and looking at saying it's ballet or it's modern or it's show dancing. But in fact, it's a much larger, larger language. Um, a wonderful dancer, Danny Ezrelo, um, I was speaking to him recently and he said, he said, you know, dance 
uh, the moment you think you know dance, you're furthest away from it, which is that Buddhist quote about God, you know. Mm -hmm. The moment you think you know God, you're furthest away from him. But, I mean, every person within him has the dance. So it's this very specific and particular expression um, peculiar to that person or to that group of people. And, uh, and it's something that I hope people will explore again, get mm -hmm. back into and, and check that part of themselves. Well, I think, I think you're right there. Um, what about, I wanted to get into a little bit this idea of music and uh, how music correlates or go back to the idea. We've already talked about it. But I think you have a pretty strong understanding of music. You were uh, talking at one point, uh, I think, about the uh, nature of music in the 60s and the 70s mm. and how uh, there were many different kinds of music. Well, yeah, I, I think mm. that the aspect, I think, is so funny. I was with a friend of mine, uh, Joe Renzetti, whom you've met, who's a, who was a, won the Academy Award and is a wonderful arranger and composer. And at one point during the 1980s, he talked to, he turned to me and he said, you realize that all the music that we're hearing will become classical music. And I laughed. I thought, this, this is all about revolution. This is all, how could this ever be classical music? And I'll be damned, but 10, 15 years later, you look at the amount of music that was put out. You look at the Beatles anthology coming up, too. It's like referring to classical music. This is classical, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, classical music. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an amazing thing to be able to have lived through that time period and look back upon it. But I think that music's gotten terribly uh, based in technology now and really lost its heart. So one of my precepts at Terpsichore is the fact that we only use live music. Uh, we will not use anything electronic. We will not use anything that's taped. Um, it's all acoustic live music because I believe there's an, an energy ball that moves between the music and the dancer and the audience. The music, that it's like passing a big beach ball around, you know, of energy. And um, and we've and once you once you're there and you see that in nature, gee, it's really one of those things you can't deny. It's right there. Mm. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, on June 16th, Margie Gillis will be performing at Terpsichore. And um, she is, I think, one of the most extraordinary dancers um, to have ever set foot uh, on the planet. And she's one of those very rare people whose, um, whose energy and whose spirit is so positive and gives such a positive feel for the dance that you can't, just looking at her, you get it. There's no question about well, what's the work or this or that. You get it. You're there. You're part of her. You're part of what's what, happening. What is her background? Where did she start? Well, she came from actually from an athletic background um, that then moved in through the dance. Um, her brother, Chris Gillis, was a well-known choreographer with Paul Taylor. Uh, he passed away uh, of AIDS. And one of the things that she's done is created a thing called the Margie Gillis Foundation which takes her a, a great deal of her profits and puts them back into the community, in this case for AIDS, but in other aspects as well. So again, going back to that idea of the arts and the dance being part of the community, not some kind of pariah that sits outside of it, but something that's really a, a part of it, an ongoing mechanism. Well, I think the other thing that's interesting about that is that there's, you know, there's been a big influence um, in, since the 60s, really, with Kennedy, where uh, exercise has become mm. so important and so on, and there's a lot of athletics, and I think athletics are very important, but I do think that some, somehow you miss a little bit of the heart of things and the inspiration if you don't have the nature of the arts in connection. So it's interesting that somebody would come out of this background mm. of athletics and have this kind of inspirational quality. Well, there, there is that aspect of winning, mm -hmm. of winning in athletics, and, and that means there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of guts. Um, sometimes the, the trained uh, dancer coming from the age of six up doesn't have that same degree of passion and I've got to have it, I've mm. got to have it. Uh, certainly that's expressed through Margie's work. And, um, Let's talk know. about young dancers and the trials and tribulations that they have to go through today. Mm. Okay, um, let's. <laughs> I mean, they start so young, right? But let's talk about ballet dancers, because that's sort of the... Well, they're put through a great yeah. deal, and they're put through a great deal early, um, and they spend most of their time working on their bodies. And what suffers, I believe, is their, is their mental capacity and their outreach and also their social skills. So they don't come out. Um, it's, uh, the, the moment that a mother says, I think little Boopsie would make a beautiful ballerina, she's made a hell of a statement. Mm -hmm. um, does, does mama know what little Boopsie is going to have to go through mm -hmm. about anorexia, about uh, the kind of hours and the time involved? So that's a great responsibility for mom to uh, mom and dad to check out before they, they start getting into that. Why? What are the reasons for, for Boopsie to dance? Mm -hmm. But there are, there are dancers that, you know, have, have inspired... Um, 
in other ways. I mean, like this uh, uh, Patricia McBride, hasn't mm. she done a lot for the dance world in, in general in terms well, she's of just talking she, about dance? And well, she's, she, has, uh, she and her husband, Jean-Pierre Bonf, who have a wonderful place in Chautauqua. They work at, with the Chautauqua Festival, and, and they've done a great job. Violette Verdi, Lynn Taylor Corbett are all up there, and they, uh, they do a great, great deal to try to um, educate, I think is the word, really. Educate and have dancers and artists take responsibility. And Jacques D'Amboise, I think, is somebody. That's Absolutely. Done, yeah. He's Could you wonderful. tell us a little, some of the things Well, he, his done? institute is wonderful, and it's really about bringing dance to, again, bringing to to all levels within the community, so that it's not so elitist, uh, but it's, again, as I was saying, bringing it in on the on the, the community basis and, and reminding people uh, how to dance for the right reasons coming from the right places. Has he ever used street dancing as a part of his Oh, yes, a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's really wonderful. He goes all across the board, and I think that's what's so important because all of the kids and the students that are involved as well as the teachers get it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not some stretch. It's not a new language. It's not a new form of communication. It's something we all do, and, uh, and he, does it, he does it brilliantly. Well, this is the note we're going to have to end on, but I want to thank you very much for being here thank with us. Thank you. And if you want to call the number on the screen, you can contact uh, Tommy directly at Terpsichore Sand, uh, his organization. I hope you'll go this summer. He's going to have lots of wonderful performances. Thank you. I'm Mary Michelle for WVIP. Are you thinking of making a dramatic change in your home? Beauty, elegance, and simple efficiency to any of your rooms. There's a simple solution, and you'll find it at Champion Tile. This pursuit of perfection. Now A&E takes you to the mystical sanctum of Delphi, where the oracle parted the mists of time to reveal hidden truths and extraordinary prophecies. Encounter the secrets of Delphi, it's one of the stories of the ages, one of the ancient mysteries. Before we unlock the future, we must find the keys to the past. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Join us as we open the door to ancient mysteries, beginning now, here on A&E. Five hundred years ago, a middle-aged woman sat in an underground chamber in this once majestic temple and forecast the destinies of kingdoms and kings. She gave her prophecies in a trance, perhaps under the influence of ancient drugs, and she often spoke in dangerous riddles that had to be pondered and understood. A bad interpretation could prove fatal. The Oracle of Delphi was the most celebrated and powerful of the ancient world. Through her, it was believed, literally, the gods spoke. The accuracy of Delphi's forecasts was uncanny covering everything from the outcome of wars to the fidelity of wives and running the length of Greek history. It was here that the first oracle is said to have foretold the coming Trojan War. Here that the democratic laws of Athens were approved. Here that Alexander the Great was declared invincible. Even the most uncompromising philosophers believed in Delphi's power. Plato, Thucydides, and men like that who questioned everything that came in front of them trusted the Delphic Oracle to give them the word of the gods. Plato put an oracle modeled on Delphi in the center of his ideal city. And it was the oracle of Delphi who declared Socrates the wisest of men. The Greeks had many ways of uncovering the will of the gods. The flight of birds, the play of fire, even the entrails of animals were all interpreted for divine signs. 
one always tries to, to discover the will of the gods. You do it by omens, right? Thunder on the right means the gods like it. A bird flying in from the right means the gods like it. But at Delphi, one could get it from the mouth of the deity himself through his priestess. The word oracle has three meanings. It refers to the priestess who delivered prophecies, to the prophecies themselves, and to the place where the prophecies were made. Incredibly, the Delphic Oracle issued prophecies for over a thousand years. But where did Delphi's clairvoyant power come from? And how could it possibly last so long? The answer to these questions may lie in Delphi itself. According to Greek myth, Delphi is the exact center of the universe. The story is that at dawn on a certain day, Zeus sent two eagles flying, one from the east end, one from the west end, and they met right over Delphi. One of the symbols of Delphi is the omphalos, the navel, uh, representing the absolute center of the world. Another legend tells the story of a Delphi shepherd named Coritus who discovered a chasm in the ground that emitted odd vapors. When humans inhaled the fumes, they could see the future. The verifiable history of Delphi begins in the 16th century BC, 1,000 years before Delphi would reach its peak. Here, at the lowest strata of these ruins, excavators found evidence of human settlement and also of a sanctuary for the worship of an ancient earth goddess named Gay. An oracle of Gay might already have been functioning at this remote time, issuing prophecies from inside this sacred cave about seven miles from the current site. In the 10th century BC, Gay was overthrown by a new and more powerful god, brought in by invaders from the north known as Dorians. The new god was called Apollo, god of reason, light, music, and prophecy. This 7th century ivory figure, excavated at Delphi, is one of the oldest images of Apollo ever found. The new god's conquest of Delphi was bloody. Apollo had to kill an enormous snake called a python that guarded the sanctuary for gay. In memory of the slain serpent and gay, Apollo chose a woman to be his high priestess and named her the Pythia. The first Pythia, also known as the Sibyl, delivered her oracles from this ancient rock. Eventually, the Pythia moved indoors into a hut made from laurel, the first of six temples of Apollo. By the time the first stone temple was built, in the 7th century BC, the fame and influence of Delphi had spread throughout the Greek world. Plague, drought, famine, war, any and virtually every crisis of state brought supplicants here, hoping to speak directly with the gods. A city-state could not function without consulting Delphi for the founding of colonies, for the establishment of new religions, for changing a religion, changing a law. Delphi had to be consulted. Delphi had to sanction it. If the Delphic sanctuary broke down, so to speak, everything in Greece would have broken down for a while. Little remains to evoke the splendor and drama of Delphi in its prime. This is the ramp that the Pythia walked up as she entered the temple of Apollo and prepared to prophecy. This, the legendary spring of Castalia, said to carry waters of prophecy, in which the Pythia bathed before she spoke. This, the sacred way along which the supplicants walked, once crammed with dazzling sculptures, monuments, and treasures from around the world. Overlooking all, the Sphinx, with its enigmatic smile, fitting symbol of the mystery of Delphi. The oracle wasn't the only reason people came to Delphi. This stadium once held spectacular athletic contests.